I always look forward to this event, and it's a really good opportunity, as David also said, to update you on the priorities for the government and the energy and resources portfolio for the coming year. I also think it's a really good opportunity for, for me to outline the work program and to signal right at the beginning of the year where those opportunities for engagement will be and, and the call we're going to make on you. I'd like to thank you, David, for that introduction. Um, I will report back to many interested parties that you've been told people couldn't hear you. I think that might be a first. <laughs> um, um, I also grew up on street corner meetings in Christchurch. Um, I'd also really like to thank you, Neil um, and Meridian, for hosting us today, and to Tina for the enormous amount of work that you put in and that your organisation put in to making this happen. Thank you very much. So, it's fair to say it, it's happened since I was here last year. And I do want to take this opportunity to thank you for the critical parts that you all played in getting the team of like five million through. You literally kept the lights running, you literally kept industry running where it could um, through level four and the, the difficult transitions through those alert levels and the adjustments that industry had to play in that. And I also thank so many of you in this room for the very important engagement that I was able to have with you through level four lockdown in particular. So thank you very much for that. <clears throat> so as we move into 2021, Dealing with COVID-19 continues to be a priority for the government. Keeping the virus out and New Zealand is safe is front and centre for us. But so is how we rebuild and how we recover from the impacts of the pandemic. Recognising the, the need to build a more resilient, fairer and sustainable future for all New Zealanders. COVID has caused many to reflect on whether to accept the status quo or step up to, step up to the change that we really need. Um, Neil, I think you said it, that this year feels different. I think that we have the, the framing of the Climate Commission report, which I'll come to, but it is also a year where I think we're all taking a deep breath and thinking, touch wood, this one's going to be different. It gives us that moment of opportunity. We understand very much that the economic recovery from COVID provides this opportunity to address many of the long-standing sustainability and environmental challenges facing Aotearoa New Zealand, including the serious threat of climate change. <clears throat> Our support for a strong and speedy economic recovery must be inclusive, it must be productive, and it must push us further and faster towards our climate change goals. We are committed to paving the way towards more low emission technologies and the infrastructure needed for a 21st century New Zealand. And I want our energy investment decisions to consider how more energy efficient, cleaner technology can de be deployed to help us on this journey to a low emissions economy. On that, and has already been talked about this morning, I'm sure you're all very aware of the Climate Change Commission's draft advice on the first three emissions budget. And Neil, I share your sentiments that our way through is to have broad, uh, multi-partisan agreement um, at a political level, but also within a, the broader industries um, affected as well, that we can come to a common, common problem definition and a common understanding of what the steps and solutions that we need to take. That's the approach that we took at a political level with the legislation that allowed the drawing up of those budgets with the Zero Carbon Act, and it's the approach that we want to take as we go through. We must build consensus around what is a long-term challenge and something that we need to address collectively. <clears throat> because it does confirm, those budgets do confirm the reality of the climate change response New Zealand must make. The proposed emissions pathway redu reductions pathways <coughs> aimed at meeting that net zero carbon target by 2050 are ambitious. They recognise what is technologically and economically realistic and they consider the impact the pathways will have on people as we go through that. Encouragingly, the draft report shows us that we have the tools and technologies available today to make those strides towards a clean and a productive industrial sector. New Zealand exporters rely on our clean green brand and there will be new opportunities for our industries as we transition to a zero carbon economy. 
In the energy sector, most of the Commission's recommendations align well with the actions that we are already taking. Actions that we are taking as a government and actions that many of you are taking as an industry. There is nothing in that report in terms of energy that I think will come as a huge surprise to anybody. I think that it, what it does is assures us that the track we are on is the right track. Obviously, we will need to make decisions on the emissions budgets by the end of the year once we see the Commission's final report due at the end of May. <clears throat> in the meantime, I look forward to hearing insights from you in this sector on how it intends to seize opportunities to transition towards decarbonisation. So you're all probably very familiar with this energy strategy slide that illustrates our priorities and work in the sector. A variation of it has also been seen three times as well as me speaking. So it is a real pleasure to see how far we have progressed on all components of this jigsaw and see, how, see movements as we pull together these pieces of the puzzle or strands into a cohesive and integrated energy strategy for New Zealand. An energy strategy fit for the future, one that looks, and I look forward to working with a broad range of stakeholders, many of you are sitting in this room, as we continue this program of work putting together New Zealand's energy strategy. So Labor's election pledged to bring forward our target of 100% renewable electricity by 2030 demonstrates this government's bold commitment to decarbonising our electricity system <coughs> at a faster rate. We have heard the views that achieving 100% renewable electricity is too difficult, inexpensive, or that we should focus on decarbonising other areas of the energy system first. But these views wrongly assume that we can only achieve progress on one thing at a time, and I believe we must focus on all the levers that we have at our disposal. Getting to 100% renewable electricity, as well as decarbonising the wider energy system by having cleaner transport and industrial heat, requires major change and investment in modern technologies. We cannot wait and hope our way towards a low emissions future. <coughs> Removing fossil fuels from our electricity system while we also increased electricity demand will be challenging, so we are getting on with the task of finding the solution. <coughs> the New Zealand Battery Project has been set up to address the issue of New Zealand's lack of dry year storage in our electricity system. The $30 million initial study will investigate pumped hydro to eliminate the need for fossil fuels in our electricity system. This was a recommendation of the Interim Climate Commission in their, in their report that came out last year, if you'll recall. The Lake, on, the Lake Onslow project, along with smaller scale pumped hydro options, are the focus of the study, with other technologies being, as being assessed as comparators. The first phase of this project is on track to report back later this year. <clears throat> so that is work that is well underway. In terms of further work that we are doing to support our industrial sector de to decarbonise, this is also a priority for the government. We have recently announced the $70 million fund for our government investment in decarbonising industry, or the GIDI fund, it's being affectionately called. This initiative supports businesses through the economic recovery from COVID-19 from, by helping them adopt energy efficiency me measures and switch from fossil fuels like coal and, and gas to cleaning energy or process heat. This part of the energy sector accounts for 9% of our emissions. So Giddy is a great example of how we are investing in that more sustainable economy. MB and ECA are currently reviewing the first round of applications and I'm very much looking forward to announcing the first tranche of projects that will be funded next month. In recent months, I have been encouraged to hear about the pledges and actions by many of you in this room and our business sector more broadly to reduce their reliance on fossil fuels and develop targets and strategies to keep doing more. Making the cuts in industrial energy emissions that the Commission highlights are both feasible and necessary to meet our 2050 target, calls on us to accelerate and expand our work. As the most carbon-intensive fossil fuel, we need to look at coal as a priority. 
This is why this government has a manifesto commitment to phase out fossil fuels and process heat by preventing the installation of low and medium temperature coal fire boilers. I'm currently considering advice from officials on the best mechanism to implement this commitment. By targeting future coal use, but sorry, but targeting future coal use will not be sufficient to bend the curve on our existing industrial emissions. We have an opportunity now, following last year's amendments to the Resource Management Act, to provide councils with national direction in addressing industrial greenhouse gas emissions. I'm currently working with David Parker, the Minister for the Environment, to develop a nationally consistent rule set for regulating coal boilers, as well as encouraging energy efficiency and best available technology across all existing sources of fossil fuels used by industry. The intention is for our national direction to be enforced by the 31st of December of this year to align with the climate change amendments to the RMA that will be coming into effect. The government will consult with the public and with you on this in coming months. And just in the, the broader work stream around the RMA that Neil touched on, I'm pleased to um, <clears throat> let all of you know that that is work that I'm well enmeshed in, um, not only as the Minister of Housing, but also as the Minister of Energy. Um, and that we have officials that are well placed within that work stream from the energy team at NB, so that we can tease through what we need to do from a planning perspective to make sure that we do have the, pay, the pace and scale that we need in terms of getting new projects off the ground. And we will continue to support our industrial sector through the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Authority's business programs, which many of you will be familiar with, such as the Energy Transition Accelerator to help Kiwi businesses plan these theater transitions to low emissions. And this is, this is why we have committed to doubling ECA's information, technical assistance, and technology demonstration support for business. This is a critical service that government needs to support businesses with. <clears throat> so despite the year having many uncertainties, um, the biggest one, which I'm sure we're all touching what about, um, I am pleased very much that the immediate future of the, of the TY Point smelter is not one of them. As a result of the deal <coughs> between Meridian and the New Zealand aluminium smelter, we now have a greater understanding and knowledge of the short-term national electricity supply and demand picture up until 2024. And that has been critical for making sure that that investment in new projects go ahead. The extended timeline also gives time for the smelter's operation, the valuable work that we will need to do with stakeholders to put in place the plans that we need to do to support the transition of the Southland economy including potential new uses of the smelter site and for Transpower to finish the necessary transmission interventions to open up new options for the use of Manapuri's electricity. It also provides the opportunity to work with New Zealand Aluminium Smelter to understand the remediation requirements for the TY site, the area being of great cultural and environmental importance to Mana Whenua and the wider Southland community and to all of us that enjoy Bluff Westis. The government is also continuing in discussions with Rio Tinto around New Zealand aluminium smelters' transmissions costs, but as we have repeatedly said, remediation on the smelter site remains an important area of focus for our discussions. So as we discuss the winding down of the smelter, the liquidation of Tamarind is also forcing the Crown to step in as a provider of last resort to fund decommissioning of the Tui oil field, and this has sharpened the focus on the petroleum sector specifically. We expect industry to follow good practice in all areas of their work, and this does include cleaning up after itself. To date, there have been commercial incentives for companies to follow good practice in all areas of work, including cleaning up. This gives companies the social license to operate, and it preserves options for future projects. Decommissioning is both a critical and normal part of operations. Critical because there are significant health and safety and environmental risks that can be arrived, can arise if it is not done right. It is normal because it is an activity that is planned for as a part of a whole lifestyle approach to resource development and use rather than an unexpected cost. Decommissioning the Tui offshore oil field is a first for New Zealand and a new role for the Crown. 
The cost to taxpayers are significant in the hundreds of millions of dollars and the government will not risk a situation like TUI happening again. In light of this, we are taking steps to strengthen petroleum sector decommissioning provisions. As a first step, I intend to introduce a Crown Minerals Act amendment bill that provides an explicit obligation on petroleum permit holders to decommission when they cease production together with strength and powers for the regulator to ensure that there is industry compliance. For many, the statutory changes we introduce will clarify existing expectations and spell out what is already industry best practice. That decommissioning must be carried out as well as adequately provisioned and planned for. We are developing a regulatory regime to support this, and we will see the which will see the regulator step up its monitoring with powers to periodically assess financial capability and to require adequate financial security for decommissioning purposes. In addition, we will see behaviour that does not meet the standards we expect across all, all areas of the CMA. We are giving the regulator access to new compliance and enforcement tools that provide effective and proportionate responses. This work is a priority for us and we intend to introduce the bill this year and to develop options for the regulations in parallel. We know that this is an area of significant interest for many and there will be many opportunities to provide feedback on both the bill and the design of the regulations later this year and we'll keep you well informed around those timelines. So the Climate Change Commission's draft report also contains recommendations about stopping new ga natural gas and LPG connections from 2025. I'm aware that most of the media attention that has been received to date on this draft recommendation thus far has re revolved around barbecues. But there is a different discussion to be had, obviously. Residential and commercial consumption of gas makes up a small proportion of our overall gas demand approximately 9% in 2019. The phase out of natural gas from our energy system is a complex issue and the Climate Change Commission has made it clear that it has a use, date, use by date in New Zealand. The question for us as a government is how we can best support this phase out while ensuring that consumers can still access the energy that they need. This will include, include considering what the most efficient emissions reductions areas may be within the market. For example, our current gas distribution infrastructure provides many opportunities for alternative lower emissions fuels to be used, including the use of biogas and hydrogen. These are all matters the government will need to consider before making recommendations about the future of natural gas in commercial and residential applications over the next 30 years or so. And I am reasonably confident that that will be a subject of much conversation throughout 2021. As we transition our natural gas market, we need to continue to provide secure and affordable energy for our electricity system and to keep some of our major manufacturing company, companies operating. Commercial arrangements in the market are evolving and we are experiencing a period of transition from traditional arrangements in the market. The current market commercial and regulatory settings in the market must be fit for purpose for, de for supporting our pathways to decarbonisation. And that's why I've asked the GIC to investigate the current settings in the natural gas market around contractual arrangements and how these affect the overall availability and flexibility of natural gas. The investigation has no predetermined outcomes and is not about changing upstream settings to unlock more gas reserves. It is about ensuring that the market continues to efficiently allocate gas to its highest value users. And I have asked the GIC to focus on two areas. The first area is how our settings in the gas market support security of electricity, particularly during periods of heightened demand, and whether these are fit for purpose for supporting thermal generation during the transition that we will be going through. The second area is around whether the current settings provide sufficient certainty and transparency about gas supply for their operations. And I, receive, I expect to receive a report from the GIC by the middle of this year. Meanwhile, we are also amending the Gas Act to provide clear regulatory powers for information disclosure issues that may have significant downstream impacts such as on electricity markets will create risks 
or security of supply. The bill also increases the maximum penalties under the Act to align with the Electricity Industry Act. I think it's important as we go through this transition, we think about our energy sector as a whole and have alignment between our regulatory regimes as much as possible. It's an important step to, en to enhancing confidence in our energy markets, ensuring transparency and helping these markets to operate efficiently. I'm also pleased that the Electricity Authority will be placing new obligations on the electricity sector participants to disclose information about thermal fuel availability. This will no doubt help inform the market, especially in the times of hydro stress. So over the last three years, you will have heard me talk um, frequently about the electricity price review and the investigations that we <coughs> undertook there about whether the electricity sector is delivering fair and equitable prices to consumers. The EPR noted that New Zealand's electricity industry works well in many respects, but consumers would benefit from stronger competition, fairer and more efficient pricing, and more openness to new technologies. The EPR made six recommendations to increase <coughs> retail competition, and four to reinforce wholesale market competition. These recommendations are currently being progressed by the EA. The EPR found that consumers struggle to make their voices heard and have little influence over electricity sector decisions that affect them. The EPR also found that energy hardship is a pressing problem. We are progressing a number of initiatives and will continue to throughout 2021 in response to the EPR findings, including appointing a Consumer Advocacy Council for residential and small business electricity consumers, establishing an energy hardship expert panel to provide advice to ministers on policy priorities for addressing energy hardship. We are also continuing to work to phase out prompt payment discounts and low fixed charges which disproportionately impact those in energy hardship. We also remain focused on green hydrogen as a clean and versatile fuel source. You'll see that one of the points, one of the pieces of the public puzzle there is our green hydrogen strategy and through 2021 we will continue this focus on, on, on hydrogen. We see it fulfilling a role similar to that which hydrocarbons play today. Green hydrogen can help reduce global emissions, reduce New Zealand's dependence on overseas energy sources, create significant export revenue and create new jobs. New, Ze New Zealand has a strategically important comparative advantage if we use our abundance of renewable energy to produce hydrogen without using fossil fuels. Looking forward to 2021 in the near future, we expect to see Obiashi and the Tuarau Paki Trust commissioning their electrolyzer and then the Mōkai Geothermal Field, which has been delayed by COVID-19. So I'm looking forward to that moment this year. We're also expecting First Gas to publish its study on the suitability of its pipeline network for hydrogen transport. And we are also looking forward to the ports of Auckland commissioning its hydrogen refueling station along with a hydrogen bus for Auckland transport field trials. And we can see that we are making significant, real, um, tangible steps in terms of seeing the part that hydrogen can play in New Zealand. To further develop hydrogen's potential, however, we need to ensure a coordinated approach both locally and internationally. And this is why the government is continuing to develop relationships with other countries interested in hydrogen's potential, including Japan, South Korea, Singapore and Germany. The importance of having a strategic roadmap for hydrogen's development in New Zealand has been underscored by our engagements with international partners wanting to invest in green hydrogen projects in New Zealand. <clears throat> Accordingly, the next step in our hydrogen strategy is to develop that roadmap which will help chart the path towards a more renewable energy system and outline how hydrogen can play a role in our decarbonisation and energy resilience. The roadmap will focus on accelerating the establishment of an export orientated green hydrogen sector, optimising the utility of green hydrogen for New Zealand's heavy transport fleet, and to better understand other potential uses, such as support to remote communities. A key purpose of the roadmap will also be to assess the future requirements for government to support in funding to develop a hydrogen economy for New Zealand and for export purposes. 
I've always been an advocate of the government leading by example. And that is why, at the end of last year, the government launched an initiative to be carbon neutral by 2025. Our government has thus far committed $10 million to replace coal boilers in eight schools and two hospitals to move towards having a clean power to public service. We also recently committed to a $28 million fund to support the installation of renewable technologies such as solar panels and batteries on public and Māori housing as part of the COVID response and recovery funds set out in Budget 2020. This project complements both our commitments to increasing energy affordability and energy efficiency. <coughs> Technology investments and partnerships can also help us develop technologies for abatement for hard to reach emissions. Taranaki based Ariake has been established to facilitate development of a low emissions energy in New Zealand. The advanced energy technology platform set up in 2019 to support and develop world leading research capability in areas of advanced energy science and to deliver on government's advanced energy technology investment goals. Funding under this platform has been provided to a range of programs including programs on delivering sustainable industry through smart process heat decarbonisation. So, there's a bit on. I hope we can all continue to successfully collaborate throughout this year. I believe that it is fundamental for our transition to a low carbon economy that will benefit all of us as New Zealanders, but as Neil alluded to, our planet as well as globally, we are facing up to the realities of the challenges ahead of us. And I continue looking forward to working with all of you throughout 2021. And I'd like to conclude by thanking so many of you for your participation and engagement in 2020. It was a hard year and your contributions were very much valued. Thank you very much. It's <laughs> <laughs> in Please, the back. So I think, as I indicated in my comments, uh, actually I think we need to be thinking about, about both. I don't think it is a dichotomy about one or the other, that in terms of how it is that we decarbonise industry, and our energy sector in terms of our industrial process, hey, we do need to think about what we do in terms of our electricity sector. I think the, the um, emphasis that we're putting around, one of the kind of the, the, the significant impediments to us getting there in terms of drying your storage shows that we're thinking about this as a whole. I think we need to start thinking about our energy system rather than this dichotomised view that we have of it. So I mean, we will obviously be publishing our, our final um, response and formal responses to the Climate Change um, Commission by the end of the year, but we have consistently said that actually we, do, we don't see the two um, as things that we necessarily need to, to, um, to, to kind of separate in such a way. If we're going to get to having 60% of our energy sector renewable, we have to be thinking about our electricity sector at the same time, so I don't think we need to rip them apart to such an extent. Mr. Andrew Jeffries from New Zealand Oil and Gas, do we, as we transition away from from a hydrocarbon fueled economy to one, um, you know, particularly in transport, we're going to need we're going to need um, to maintain the existing infrastructure, so your fuel stations, your terminals, your um, but companies are not going to be incentivised to invest in those if they know that there's an end period. So, as the as there been some thinking in how you how you continue to maintain the existing infrastructure in an environment where you're saying, well, there's an end date down there. Yeah, and I, I actually think that the, the industry itself is starting to think about those. I mean, we mm. have um, Z that um, has previously been active in the biofuels market, for, for example, so they're, they're starting increasingly to see themselves as energy suppliers um, rather than petrol, as it were, um, or diesel. Um, so I think that we will continue to work with it. Obviously the infrastructure is vitally important as we build up the infrastructure for powering electric cars or hydrogen fueling stations. We need to make sure that um, 
while we still have um, combustible engine cars that rely on fossil fuels, that their infrastructure is there. So they, they are conversations that we're having, but I have um, no indication uh, that um, any of those uh, companies that are providing the petrol to consumers are going to pick up sticks anytime soon. Uh, Minister, thank you very much. Uh, Eric Pyle from Solar Zero. Uh, Vietnam installed uh, in the last year um, 25 terawatt hours of rooftop solar from a standing start of zero. And I was chatting to uh, some people from MB who told me that the sun doesn't shine that well in New Zealand. My question to you is, could you ask MB just to look outside the window occasionally and at the great uh, fusion reactor in the sky? Yeah, and look, I mean, I think... Um that one of the critical things around the issue of dry gas storage is actually about unlocking the potential of solar in that puzzle of New Zealand. Because we know that New Zealand peaks are at night um, and in winter, and, to, and that is when the sun isn't shining quite as much. Uh, but we, if we have the ability to use our hydro system more like a battery, and that's why we're calling the project New Zealand's battery, then we actually do have the potential to unlock some of those technologies. So I can assure you, they see the sun shine. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rebecca Notch, Head of Renewable Development for Meridian. Hi. Hi. Um, obviously to meet the challenges coming, coming up, especially in terms of new generation, um, we're hoping that the consent pathway and durations of consent will be considered as part of the RMA reviews. Yep. I'm just looking for some reassurance around that. Yes, um, and as I indicated in the remarks that I made, that um, the officials uh, from, the, from the energy team at MB are well integrated into that work stream around the RMA. Um, I'm engaged as a minister too, as I said, not just as the Minister of Housing, but also as the Minister of Energy. I know when I first became Minister in 2017, one of the issues that was brought to my attention was some of the consents that set out there were now out of date in terms of the size of turbines. When I came back and said, let's fix that, they would say, no, that's not the problem. So I think we do need to have a really detailed discussion around exactly what those impediments are and have um, a, a, a good problem definition around um, what the roadblocks are. I also encourage that while we do go through r reform and the significant progress that Minister Parker is making in that area, we also do have the fast-track COVID provisions. Now, I'm not saying every project will qualify under, under that, but I am asking people to consider that as an option of a way um, to, to accelerate some projects. Yeah, Minister Chris Chill, Genesis. Um, one of, a lot of the projects that Neil alluded to and you've alluded to are projects that are close to the grid mm -hmm. and um, are ready to go. I, I suspect a lot of the projects that are going to be needed to deliver the next phase of um, the generation are probably further from the grid. Is the, are, the, are the settings for grid development being considered somewhere, um, and how does that get paid for? It is it socialised, or is it, is it continue to be a first mover as to pay? What's well, your thinking on that? We're actually getting. Um, so I can, I can point you to getting that actually one of the explicit provisions that we have in here that I know one of the impediments to electrification can be that first user pays moment where you know if you're the first to get the power on, you pick up the tab. Um, so that is one of the things that we've signalled, um, that we're willing to, look, to work with industry around um, how we can best get those transitions happening um, in industrial and process heat. So it is something that's firmly in our sights um, and that we already have a funding stream that is set up to assist with. Yeah. Okay. I'm conscious of people's time, not, not least. <laughs> <laughs> Minister, thank you very much again for, for the time, uh, the care and attention we put in your remarks. Uh, uh, we look forward to these occasions, um, partly of course because of the timing to start the year, uh, but mainly because of the enormous responsibilities that, that, that you have uh, So thank you for uh, addressing us um, so comprehensively and substantively. Uh, I don't think there's more that we could have asked. Uh, it, it occurs to me uh, that there is one other thing that has changed in the last, uh, in the last 12 months. Um, I'm a bit surprised at the way that neither of us uh, referred to it until now. That is, of course, uh, that the government now does have the majority that it sought. Um, so uh, we look forward very much uh, to that being used. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please <laughs> <laughs>